Praise the Lord. Well, that's a good place to start if you're asking God. Amen. What can I do? Get your heart surrendered. It's good to see that you have some surrendered hearts or you'd be still in bed under an umbrella somewhere. Amen. <laughs> It's good to see that, you know, some people don't like to come to church on rainy days. I prefer it. I'm just one of those weird guys, I guess so. And thank you, brother. Is that for me? Is that real? Must be Dennis's. Didn't you lose some money this morning? Yeah. Maybe the Lord wanted you to give it this morning. Maybe he wanted you to give it to the pastor. <laughs> Be warm and filled. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. I almost got it. I just split it with you if you've been quiet about it. But <laughs> Look what the Lord gave us. Well, praise the Lord. I want to speak to you. You know, last few Sundays we've been talking about Gideon. And last couple of Sundays especially, we stomped and screamed and beat the pulpit up some. Hopefully you get some of the message. Today I just want to just give you a very simple challenge from the Word of God today. Of, uh, you know, as we talked about getting, and almost every time we do a character study, we get into that, the whole idea that when God touches your life, you're a new individual. You're not what you used to be. And too many Christians are trying to go back to what they were, or somehow think they can feel more comfortable in their skin being what they used to be. And, and it's never going to work. If you're a miserable Christian, all right, it, it can almost guarantee it gets down to the fact that uh, you're resisting who God made you to be and what God made you to be. Uh, most time that people get in that mode, it's, it's a hard life to live because you're not experiencing the fullness of, of Christ in your life. You're not experiencing the new life that's yours in Jesus Christ. I think probably as long as I have been a Christian and especially been in Baptist churches, that anthem verse has always rang true for if any man in Christ, he is a... See, you, you know it. He's a new creation. Old things pass away and all things become new. The frustration, I believe, in our life begins many times when we're just not discovering who we really are in Christ Jesus. So I want to offer you a challenge today to, to dare to live the new life. You know, to get up daily and you start your mornings with a whole mindset. And we call it risk, but you know, when you, if, you, if, you're, if you're an actuary or you work in that kind of counting or something in that, that regard, you, where you measure risk versus reward, you realize that when you really study scripture, the risk versus reward there really is no risk at that point. The rewards are so great for living for Jesus, they outweigh the risk factor enormously so that if, if the truth be known and we have the eyes to see it and the heart and mind to comprehend it, then there's, the risk issue is irrelevant. I wanna to talk to you about a, a man by the name of Ananias today who lived in a time when the risks were much higher uh, to live for Jesus than what they are, at least in the Western Hemisphere. We know in some parts of the world, they're being beheaded or burned alive because of their, their faith in Jesus Christ. But here, in the comfort of the good old USA, even though more and more takes place daily in the realm of what I call persecution, but it hasn't yet hit home for a lot of folks. When it does, it'll, it'll be a different world. But when it does, it should get us to the point to realize there may be some risk involved. Ananias was a guy who lived in the time where the apostle Saul, Paul then, uh, Saul before that, comes to a place of... Uh, of, of meeting Christ. You, you remember the story on the road to Damascus where he's knocked off his high horse, demobilized and blinded. It's the best I can put it. He has an encounter with the Lord Jesus which leaves him blinded and he's led back to, to the city he was going to anyway, which was Damascus. And I, I don't want to talk about Paul this morning. We've dealt with him on so many different occasions and the ministry, the life that he lived, the message that he shared. I want to look at a, a character that's kind of uh, just embedded in the story. And he's mentioned several times in scripture by the name of Ananias, who certainly had to come to this kind of decision and, and, and weigh these kind of things out in his own heart and mind. Is it better to, you know, to be concerned about the risk involved or to obey the Lord? And he chose to obey the Lord. Let's look at this in scripture. This is just, this is following the very incident where, uh, you're going to have to flip those for me apparently, or select the very first slide and sometimes it'll go or reset the deal. Anyway, in Acts 9, you'll catch up, says, now there was a certain disciple at Damascus. This, this is talking about Ananias. This is immediately following, again, Saul's encounter with the Lord. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, behold, here am I, Lord. And the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he's praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named 
Ananias, whom he's talking to, come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, probably with a bit of pause there as well, Lord, I've heard from many about this man and how much harm he did to, the, to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call upon thy name. But the Lord said to him, go for he's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias departed. And he entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he arose, and he was baptized. And he took food and was strengthened, and for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. Now, if you follow the story through, the next verse is talking about, and so Paul went to the synagogue in Damascus and began to preach. Here was his message. Jesus is the son of God. That was the message that he shared. And by the way, I really believe that these, this, this element of verse 19, where it says that he was, he was filled with the spirit and the elements that take place in verse 19, where he's fellowship with the disciples and preaching the word of God. Those are good evidences that you've encountered the Holy Spirit in your life that you, have, you want to have relationship with the saved as well as with the lost. You know the necessity of being with Christians and you know the necessity of sharing your faith with people who do not know Jesus Christ. Now, Ananias is, is, a, great thing, is a great story to relate, I think, where so many Christians are today. They, this guy obviously has met the Lord Jesus. And there's several things I want to look at today and, and, and refer to him. The key verse we're going to look at is here in, in this verse where he says, now there was a disciple. If you read it in a couple of other translations, it says, there was a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he says, hear my Lord. A couple of things we'll look at. In fact, there's about three things that, that stand out. And of course, you know, with these three points, there'll be a couple of uh, sub points that we'll look at as well. But we're only told these three things. And I, I think that kind of flow from the story about him. He's ready. He's willing. He's faithful. Let me just say it one more time. And we're going to deal with each one individually. He's ready. He's willing and he's faithful to go and do exactly what the Lord tells him to do. In the context of him being ready, there's a couple of things that I want to mention here. He is referred to as that certain disciple. What certain disciple? What, what made him stick out? I, I think when you follow the story through and you see his faithfulness and his loyalty to Christ and his love for God and even his love for Saul, you begin to realize <laughs> that the scripture, when it says there's a certain man, it means that he has the attention of God. It means he's on God's radar. Now, he has the attention of God because the Bible tells us that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth seeking someone whom he may use, someone with a clean heart or with a pure heart. And so as the Lord's looking at his radar here, and we'll use that terminology, as Paul said, forgive me in the folly of my flesh here. But as he used this, you know, the idea here that there's someone who gets the attention of God. God has something he wants done. God has a desire in his heart that he wants fulfilled and established. And so he looks for someone to do it. Now, please understand me today that this is a couple of thousand plus years ago. But please understand very clearly today, I believe that the eyes of the Lord are still looking for people he can use. He's looking for that certain person that when he speaks to him, he knows he's going to respond. He knows that something's going to come of it. He's not just going to be speaking into the air. So he's called a, a certain man here. But not only that, in, in Acts 22, if you see another reference to Ananias, there he's referred to as a devout man according to the law. Now, if you're a devout, devout man according to the Baptist, that's something different than a devout man according to the law. He stood by some very rigid convictions and some very strong standards, which seem to be elements that are lost in the church today. People having convictions, people with standards. In fact, if you have convictions today and you have standards, you have some lines that you're not going to cross, some things that you know are obviously morally incorrect and morally impure and morally unright. This guy has these lines set clearly in his mind. He said, I'm not going there. I'm not going to do that. Now, if you choose to live that kind of life, 
You may have a, 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 a testimony among some as, as, as being a legalist or whatever it was. But hey, with Ananias, these are issues of importance to him. They are issues of integrity. They are issues of character. He's not the kind of guy who sits around the dinner table and says, well, honey, let's go do this because everybody else is. You know? Everybody else is doing this. And I know, you know, old, old Bob down at the church, he does it, so we can do it. So if they do it, I mean, where do we get that we should live our lives according to the standards set by anybody else but Jesus? All right? If they have loose standards, do I have loose standards? I need to find out what the scripture says, what the Lord says, and what his desire is for my life, and choose to embrace that. Here's a certain by somebody God has, has his mind set on, on Ananias. Because I believe part has to do with this, this fact that he has some integrity in his life and some commitments in his life. He's, he's devout. Nothing is morally unimportant to him. Everything is important. He, you could put him under a microscope, run the test, he passes the test. He's a genuine thing. He's the kind of guy that, that's going to make a difference. But not only does it tell us he's a devout Jew in Acts 22, it also tells us there that he had a good report of all the Jews who dwelt there. And by the way, remember, it's something as a born-again Jew to have a good reputation among all the Jews. Remember, Jesus wasn't readily accepted by many of the Jews. And there was a religious group of the Jews, especially whom Ananias probably was very devout to in the beginning. But I, you know, you would think that after he makes his commitment to Christ that there's some suspicion upon his life. But there was something about Ananias, his integrity, his consistency, his commitment, his character, so that everybody said, if you want to look at what that's all about, you look at Ananias. Yeah. Ananias wasn't the guy that two people be sitting around and one says to the other, hey, have you considered this thing Christianity? And the other guy says, well, I thought about it, but I looked at Ananias and I said, man, if that's what Christianity is about, I don't want anything to do with it. His name wouldn't be used in that conversation. Amen? That's not where you're going to find his name. His name be used in the conversation. He says, yeah, I look at Ananias. I, I, you know, he seems to be the real deal. He seems to be the real deal. He's someone that, that, that hey, I, I think we, can, we should listen to because, hey, he's thought well of by the people around him. He's thought well of the people he does business with. I mean, he, he's a diplomat for the kingdom. He, he's an ambassador for Christ. He realizes his position to stand not only before the Lord, but for a lost world. And he has a responsibility to live it before a lost world. He didn't kind of have the separation of church and state mentality that so many Christians address today. Well, I got my church life and I got my, my business life and I, you know, they, then I got my, my sport life and I got this life. No, we have one life and it's lived in Christ. Out of that flows everything else. You can't divvy up your, your spirituality and your Christian walk in your Christian life. So you look at his readiness, but the second thing and, and we talked about was his willingness. It's not an easy thing he's asked to do. I mean, the apostle is probably the most, most notorious anti-Christ, anti-Christian person in the known world at the time. This guy is zealous to destroy Christians. He's zealous to imprison them. The Bible says he drugged them out of their homes. I mean, there, there's no habeas corpus read here. There's no, there's no civil rights here. He storms into your house. He has a decree from the high priest to do whatever he wants to do in dealing with Christians, and he, he takes every advantage of it. In fact, the very reason he was coming to Damascus was to, to ruin to, and destroy Christians. So he's on his way, and Ananias knows he's on his way. He's got authority to come in, wreak havoc among the Christian community, and the Lord says to Ananias, there's somebody I want you to talk to. His name's Saul. Hello? <laughs> yeah, that's that Saul? Well, Lord, I've heard. And, and this is the only statement that he makes. It's just, it is this, this moment of identification to the task at hand. Is that the Saul? Is it, I've heard about him, the one who comes to ruin Christians, destroy Christians. And, and, but the debate's over at that point. There's this willingness in his life to do what the Lord says to do. And the Lord just confirms this, who it is, this is what I want you to do. And without any delay, any further argumentation, any other statements of, uh, 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 to carry on some kind of rhetorical dialogue with the Lord here, it doesn't take place. And Ananias at this point, he's obedient. And look, he's obedient to the time. He gets up and goes and does it when he tells him. He's obedient to the place. He goes right where he tells him. And he's obedient to the results. It's just whatever you want, Lord, it's what we'll do. 
Those are three areas that I find in my own Christian life that I probably argue with the Lord the most on. You know, do it. Well, right now? <laughs> You're right now. This is the best time. Is right. I'm speaking to you about it now. This is the best time. Well, I think I need to pray about it some more. Folks, when the Lord reveals his will, the prayer is over. It says, bless me, help me, I'm going, I'm done. I'm moving forward. So it's, it's, the time is now and the place is wherever he says, well, Lord, I think I wouldn't know. This is where, where the place is, is wherever he says it. But Lord, you know, we're in the grocery store here. Or Lord, you know, we're, 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 we're at work or we're, hey, just be obedient to the time and the place. And the results, that's God's responsibility too. Uh, he, he just lets God, whatever happens at this point is what's going to happen. I'm going to do whatever it is that I'm supposed to do and we'll see what happens as a result of me. Step out. Be what you've been called to be. Do what you've been called to do. See what God does at that point. So he just goes in and the when and the just and the where and is all left into God's hands. Just do what God tells him to do. Time, place, results. But also I want you not just to look at his willingness. I want you to look at his faithfulness this morning. And Ananias went his way, it says. You're going to see Ananias moving in with this, this spirit of compassion. The spirit of love. And then you're going to see the spirit of loyalty. And you're going to see the spirit of lowliness. Three strong character ingredients to our spiritual life. And they all work together. They work in sync. That if we have love, there'll be loyalty. If we have loyalty, there'll be lowliness. If we have lowliness, it's because we have love. And all these elements are, are tied in one with the other. And really the ultimate one is that, that out of love. Look when he goes and he, and he speaks to the, to the apostle who's just the, the murderer out here. And Ananias went his way. He entered into the house. He put his hands on him and said, Brother Saul. Now, I don't know. There has to be something that, you know, Saul knows somebody's coming. He's had a dream. Some guy named Ananias is going to come lay hands on him. That could mean a couple of things in his head. I don't know. <laughs> I'd like to lay hands on some of you. <laughs> You'd like to lay hands on me at times, amen? But somebody gonna come lay hands on you. And he comes, and without castigating, without saying, you sorry, worthless Saul, I can't, you know what you've been doing to the kingdom? Do you know the trouble you've caused? Do you know the heartache that you brought to families, the division, the strife, the pain, the agony because of what you've done? And he just says, Brother Saul. Well, powerful words. When you talk about just chilling, the atmosphere changes, I believe, at this very moment. When those words are uttered, the whole, the whole room begins to change. There's no threat. There's no antagonism. There, there's, no, there's no arrogance. He says, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, appeared unto thee in the way as thou hast. You, know, you came and he sent me so you could receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Man, this is an absolute demonstration of how Christians should be moving forward with the grace of God and the love of God, reaching out, ministering to people, reaching people where they're at. I mean, there's plenty of condemnation. Yes, we do need to make it very clear. The reason we're separated from God is because of our sin. But here's a man who's already been thoroughly dealt with about that issue. And he's ready. And there are times in our life, I believe God brings us to people who are just ready. They're like, Fruit ready to fall from the tree. They just need a nudge. They just need someone to reach out. They just need somebody who really cares. And here he moves forth, you know, with, with, that, with that love and that attitude that's just demonstrated, even in the words that he says. But it's also seen in the way he relates himself to the Lord. This is what he says. He says, the Lord, even Jesus. Now, Paul's had this, this encounter with God, Saul, on the road already, so he separated that issue of who is the Lord and who is Jesus. And he's discovered they're one and the same. But here is, look at, look at Ananias' attitude towards Jesus. He's not just the teacher, he's not just, he's not just you know, a prophet, he's the Lord. This attitude of, of submission, this attitude that he comes from, of, and really just loyalty, the, those words, he, he affirms the Lordship of Christ. He doesn't, he doesn't shy away from that. He doesn't shrink away from the fact. It, it, it's a great choice uh, and a blend of his devotion, I think is seen in his words here, as well as his commitment. I love the Lord, Jesus, and he's the Lord. And so he comes with this, this attitude uh, of, of, of reverence and respect and honor as he even mentions the name of the Lord Jesus as he comes to Paul. But also there's something else, don't miss this. His own humility, the lowliness in which he's done this he, he, and towards himself. He doesn't make a big deal about who he was. The Lord sent me. 
He doesn't give a great explanation, doesn't give any reference to himself. The Lord sent me. He didn't pull out his ministry brochure. He didn't show him his Ananias for Jesus t-shirt. You know, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't give his reference list. I'm that certain devout disciple whom respected among the community in the neighborhood. You, you've heard of me, right? None of that. Jesus sent me to talk to you. Now this show, and again, these elements of, of love, loyalty, and lowliness, they work, they, they work in such powerful combination when, they, when, when they're demonstrated in, in someone's life. And I believe anybody will come just with that same kind of humility towards the Lord, recognition that he is the Lord, loyalty to, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, commitment to his headship over their life, and with the love of God in their life and heart, then something begins to happen through their life. Powerful something. And we, we've, over the years, and 25 years of ministry, I don't know how many messages I've preached on soul winning and witnessing and the importance of sharing your faith in Jesus Christ and all those elements of it and over, uh, insights for overcoming fear. I mean, boldness and how to walk in boldness. I mean, literally dozens upon dozens of sermons. When I look back over all the sermons I've preached in, in, in my computer file, I have everything divided by topic. And under, I have one topic just called evangelism, witnessing. And under it, there's probably 30, 40 sermons under there. This talk about the fact of the importance that, we, that, we, that God puts it upon our lives. But it really gets down to this whole issue I'm talking about this morning. It's our identity. It's what we are. We are a witness for Christ. It's, that's what we, it's not what we do. It's what we are. And we realize what we are. It's amazing how what we do begins to kick in gear. And all too often, we look at this element of the Christian life. We can get all right with that Bible study stuff. We might get all right with the church attendance stuff. And we might be all right with it, you know, even with the giving. But when it comes to standing up, confessing Christ openly before others, sharing our faith in Jesus, the change of life that he's brought into us, and telling people about it, man, it, it wasn't Bill Stafford used to say, he said, you know, most, most Christians, he knew were, you know, were like the rivers of Alaska, froze up at the mouth. Yeah. Nothing's coming out. Nothing's being said. Nothing's being expressed. And I, I do believe the heart of that gets down to what I'm talking about here. You, you haven't yet realized who you really are. You are the salt of the earth. He didn't say you are like the salt of the earth. I mean, the clear words, red letter edition of the gospel, Jesus is speaking, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its saltiness, its savor, it's good for nothing. And unfortunately, when we move to that place in our life, where we lose our savor and our saltiness because our walk is not really right with God, guess what? We also are good for nothing. We're good. Oh, we go to church. I'm good. I give my money. I'm good. I, I'm, I'm, I'm at home taking care of my family. I'm good. But yeah, you're good for nothing. <laughs> your goodness is it's just simply a demonstration of what God's done in your life. He's changed you. That devotion, that devoutness that it talked about in Ananias' life was simply because he loved God. But when it becomes internal and our life turns inward, we fail to see a lost world anymore. We fail to hear the Lord because he does speak to us and he does say to us in the everyday venues of our life, just like Ananias, he's looking for someone to reach out and say a word to that individual with whom he's dealing with. Just, he's dealt with Saul. Ananias didn't know God had dealt with Saul. Ananias is doing the Ananias thing that he does every day. And then the Lord speaks to him in a vision and says, I'm doing something over here. But we might not have a vision, but how often do we sense the internal promptings of the Holy Spirit in our walk in life? When the Lord says, you need to slow down and talk to that person. Slow down and say something to that person. Slow down and pray for that person. Slow down and ask that person how's their walk with God. Do they know Jesus? And something happens. We begin to lose our identity. Well, I just can't do that. Well, yes, you can. Well, that's not me. Yes, it is. And who are you to say it isn't when God said it was? God said, you're the salt of the earth. Oh, I am? Yes, you are. You are the light of the world. You are. He doesn't say, try to be the light of the world. Does it? Nowhere in Scripture does it say, try to be the light. It just says, let your light shine. Let your light shine. Well, how do you do that? You just do it. Just be what you are. Do what's on your heart. Do what's stirring in your spirit. Do what's turning in your mind. You've met with God. God lives in you. That's not metaphorical. He does live in you. 
It's not some kind of illustrative, nice, wonderful symbol of something else, ethereal. No, he lives in you. Christ in you, the hope of God. Your body is indwelt by deity. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. You're here for a reason. Let the reason happen in your life. Why doesn't it? A lot of it, I think, gets back to where he, when he rebuked him about the light thing. When he said, hey, you don't put your, your candle under your bed. We talked about that last week. It represents our, our spiritual lethargy and our slothfulness. And you don't light your candle and put it under a bushel, representing our materialistic mindset. It's the same thing that keeps the Word of God from bearing fruit in our life when he said that this worldliness and the cares of the world will choke out the seed of the Word of God. It just chokes us out. Yes, we do live in this world. We do have to take care of business. We do raise our families. We, we do pay our bills. We do go to work. But in the context of all those things we do, we must be what we are. And we are the salt. And we are the light. The city that's set on the hill. The city that's recognized. The city that is obviously seen to those who are around us. Uh, you know, it's amazing what happens here in Paul's life. You see the change that literally comes over him and becomes the greatest voice for Christianity since Jesus. Let me give you just a couple of practical applications and we'll close with these. One, I'll put it with the Joe Arms method. I'll read it first. <laughs> Never complain about your circumstances. Now listen to me. This is what this means in simple terminology. Quit your whining. Quit your whining. Are you listening to me? Everybody look at me and say, I'm going to quit my whining. <laughs> quit your whining. Start shining. What, what destroys and hinders and causes the flame not to be seen is our whining and our complaining. It's like you gripe about everything. You whine. You, it's raining today. Get over it. Where would you be without the rain? I mean, if we go by what you want, we'll die of thirst. We have to have water, all right? Quit your wine. It's hot today. Come on, get a life. <laughs> you know, my wife, she's not very nice to me. Well, look at the way you're acting. <laughs> you know, just, I mean, on and on the list could go. And how often could we just say, oh, get over it. Now, I know some of us have some real issues going on in our life. But let me tell you, there's a simple, a simple solution. Get over it. <laughs> But you know, it's a big, yeah, it is a big deal. And my heart breaks you. But if you sit there and all you do is focus on your little dilemma, which may be a big dilemma, the more you focus upon it, the bigger it gets. But as long as you do that, there'll never be a resolution to your crisis. It's in investing yourself and investing your life in others and in people and situations in the world around you that God does a supernatural work in your life. Just practical illustration. Quit complaining. God, God, is, God is doing something through all that mess in your life. God's building a greater message in your life through all that mess. And the mess should obviously lead to the message. God uses it to refine and, and do a deeper work. Number two, simple application. Serve the Lord when, where, and it says, and wait for his results. Just wait for his results. In due season, you shall reap if you faint not. Serve the Lord. Just be about honoring and loving the Lord Jesus. Number three. Be faithful in a small circumstance. And by the way, the Bible says if you're faithful in little, he'll reward you with much. Be faithful in whatever opportunity you've been given to just do it. To just do it. Well, I'm not much. My life doesn't mean much. And maybe Ananias is sitting on the couch that afternoon saying, I don't really, you know, I don't want God to use me. I don't know if God will ever use me. And all of a sudden, okay, I'm ready to use you. Him? Saul? You sure? No. Where is he? He's on the street, call straight, get over there and talk to him now. He's at a house of Judas, you'll find him. And he goes about and he finds him. Be ready for it. Service. And all too often the reason we're not ready for it is because we're looking for a way out instead of a way in. Wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I hear, I, here I am. And that, that was the simple words of Ananias. The Lord said, Ananias, here am I. What do you want? Isaiah, here am I. Send me. Isn't it good to know that God still uses people? And you know as well as I, and some of you have been saved for a long time, and you know, it's like I say, preaching to the choir. 
you've been exactly in a place where you've really been on fire for the Lord in this regard and pl in place where you have it. And you know that in the times that you're really being honest and humble and sincere with the Lord Jesus in this regard, how much he rewards your life. You've seen the blessing. You know the fullness. You know the joy. You know the victory that comes to you when somebody comes to know Christ. I mean, it's, you, you, as a Christian, you, you got to tell somebody, I, I let so-and-so, it was just great, man. God touched their life. And, you know, you're acting like you did it. Really, the Lord did it. But just it's, it's in those moments that you experience the greatest victory and the greatest joys. Be ready for service at any time. Just down to take the risk. Take the risk. Just do it. And again, when you go back to the whole issue of risk versus reward, you know that it is well worth the risk. I mean, the stories of Ananias as well as the story of Saul, you know, the truth is that they have a, they have a transformed life. It's obvious. God's done something in them. God's done something in you. God's done something in me. And there's no accounting in the realm of the natural for what God's done in us. It's only a supernatural thing. When God saved you, it was a supernatural act whereby he imparted new life, forgave your sins, made you a brand new person. And part of that is, is there's this unction that he's placed in you to be used by him and, and to honor him with your life. Here's what the apostle said later on. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. That's, that identifies everybody who knows Jesus Christ. We're servants of Christ. He's the Lord. Paul, the Lord sent me. Even Jesus has sent me here to you. I have a message. Mysteries of God. That's the gospel. Been hidden from the ages till now. We are the generation. We are the church. It's the church age who shares the greatest mystery of all. That God loves man enough to become a man and die on the cross and pay the ultimate sacrifice for man's sin and become the offering for that sacrifice and is buried. His sacrifice of death is received by the mercies of God and he raises Jesus from the dead and he's coming back again. The gospel is so simple, isn't it? But how powerful it is. Illustration we've shared before is in Romans in chapter 1. Paul said, I am ready to preach the gospel. For it is the, you mean the next word? Power of God. It's the power of God. You may not see the explosion that takes place when you share the gospel, but I guarantee it's happening. It's that word dunamis. It's the word we get our word dynamite from. That kind of power, that explosive power. In other words, when you tell somebody about Christ... They may have the most bl blank look on their face, like they didn't get it, they're not hearing it, they don't understand it. But I can guarantee you that in their heart of hearts, there's explosions going off of God's doing something in their life. God's working in their heart and their life. And I guarantee, folks, not only that, I believe it's probably happening right now in your life. Even as a Christian, the power of the gospel is explosive. Even right now, there's something you spirit say, yeah, you know, I've, I've, been, I've cut myself off from a lost world. I've been too preoccupied. I've been too busy. It's been under the bed. It's been under the bushel. Wherever it's been, it just hadn't been shining. And I just need to be a light. I need to be open. I need to be usable in the hands of God. So whatever God says and whatever he desires, he can find a certain Joe Arms or whatever your name might be. A certain disciple. I can trust him with the message because he's going to get it where it needs to go when it needs to get there. I, I can't encourage you enough as your pastor to enjoy the spirit-filled life. And it's most demonstrated in our mouths. Every time in scripture when you see that says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, it's always followed up by the preaching of the gospel. They were filled and they spoke the word of God with boldness. They were filled and they preached the word of God. They were filled. And on and on again. You see it over and over again throughout the book of Acts. You see it in the gospels. You see it in the message throughout the letters. There's something about Surrendering my life to the Holy Spirit, how my mouth gets in gear. Amen? I have a simple invitation this morning. I have these what I call risk bands instead of wrist bands. They look like this. And this is a reminder that you can just wear every day. I should wear it for at least a month, but you can wear it as long as you want. Now, some of you with bigger wrists, you can take them Where'd it go? Here it is. And you can put it around your cell phone just like this. And it's always there. <laughs> if that doesn't work, you pull your big fat wallet out. Put it around your wallet. 
So every time you're going somewhere, you're always going somewhere paying for something, aren't you? I mean, just about everywhere you go anywhere, you're putting your wallet out for something, your purse out. Have it there. Most of all, you can wear it as a witness. So when you have it on, people are going to see it. And a lot of times before you can say anything, they're going to say, what is that? One side, it says uh, unashamed. The other side, it says believer. So when they ask you, what's that say? That says unashamed believer. That's me. <laughs> I'm an unashamed believer. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the power of God of salvation. Amen. Well, go ahead and praise the Lord. That's you. Unashamed believer. But it'll also remind you to pray for the lost. It'll remind you to keep your heart right with God because at any time you could be the certain disciple God's wanting to give a word to and through to someone else. So if the Lord's impressed your heart about being more committed in this regard, and you found yourself slipping and lax and becoming lazy or so preoccupied with all the affairs of this world that you have just left off the most important things, and that's the Lord and His mission through your life and in your life. And I'm going to encourage you to stand with me now as the band comes.